Good morning, everyone. So good to see you on this bright and cool morning, cold, freezing, better than it was earlier this week, at any rate. And so glad that you're here with us in person. Are those following us online? We're so glad to have you. And uh, so thankful for God's faithfulness because with winter comes, then comes spring. You know, uh, what a week we've had for winter weather here, a snow, freezing. And, but the reality is God's still faithful, and he still watches over us, gives us the strength that we need, the grace, and the wisdom uh, to take care of things. And I'm so glad you're here today. It's a wonderful thing to see us. So let's look to the Lord in prayer as we begin. Dear Jesus, thank you for another day you've given to us. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, encourage our hearts this morning. There's much in our world that is discouraging, many, many things, uh, maybe personal problems, world problems, Lord, Lord, allow us to look to you uh, for wisdom, for guidance, for encouragement in our time, in this day, in this moment, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, good morning, church family. Let's stand up for our first hymn this morning. 137, it's just like his great love. It's just like his great love. for a friend I have called Jesus whose love is strong and true and never fails however to strike no matter what I do I've sinned against this love of his but when I now to pray confessing all It's like Jesus to roll the clouds away. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Sometimes when clouds of trouble blot out the sky above, I cannot see my Savior's face. I doubt his wondrous love, but he from heaven's mercy seat, beholding my despair, in love removes the clouds between, and shows me he is there. It's just like Jesus to roll the clouds away, it's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Oh, I could sing forever of Jesus' love divine. Of all his care and tenderness for this poor life. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, Brother, I was going to read for us uh, Psalm chapter 19, verses 7 to 14. Amen. Well, it's great to have you with us this morning. Uh, you can turn your Bible with me or it's in the back of your bulletin. Psalm chapter 19, verse 7 to 14. The Bible says, Psalm chapter 19, 7 to 14. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Amen. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. 
Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret, secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Praise the Lord. God has given us this book. It's not just some literary work. It's not just any book, friend. It's God's word. And Second Timothy, the Bible says that it is profitable for doctrine, for, uh, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So as God's word is open uh, for us this morning, let's be sure to take heed to it. Friend, it can change your life, and it will if you would. Just some announcements for our church family podcast on Tuesday. We'll be looking at the book of Micah, so I hope you can listen into that. And then Wednesday is our Zoom meeting at 7 p.m., and if you do miss it, you can always catch it later on our website. We have it there available for you to listen to. Uh, there won't be any uh, Facebook devotion this coming Saturday, so just keep that in mind, and uh, so none this week. Um, and then uh, this is our last Sunday. We're taking an offering for our brother Rick Russ. And uh, things are going fairly well with him and his treatment. Uh, it's not getting any worse, praise the Lord, uh, and things of that nature. He's hoping within the next few weeks to be able to get out of the hospital and for the for treatments and things. So uh, let's continue to pray for him. And uh, I know it will be a blessing uh, to him to receive that funds that we are gathering for him to help pay for the, the treatment down there in Texas. And to be continue to pray for one another as well. Uh, a lot of folks have been sick. I know a lot of folks have recovered, and we praise the Lord for that. And uh, Pastor Matt's back and his family. We're happy to have him back. Uh, that's just one of the many in our church who have been sick over the last little while. So let's be in prayer. Let's be reaching out, encouraging each other. And then uh, upcoming, uh, this in February, it's only one more day of January. So that's hard to believe. Uh, but in February, so far, we have planned is uh, on the Sunday, February 13th, True North. So it's going to be coffee after service, bring your own lunch. And a time of discussion. So look forward to that. That's uh, February the 13th. And uh, so mark down your calendars, True North. And then uh, February the 20th. I uh, mentioned last week, I was going to give you some more announcements about that. So that's Family Day Sunday. Uh, it's going to be a little bit different setup on that Sunday. Uh, we're going to have regular service here at 9. And then immediately following the AM service, we're going to have like a family activity time, you could call it. And uh, this, we'll have a digital sign-up. We need you to sign up. And I'll tell you that in a minute why. Uh, but uh, sign up once we get it up. Uh, but we're going to have some goofy songs with the kids. We're going to have games, Bible trivia, uh, time puzzle matches for the competitive spirits in our church. And we have lots of those in our church, right? And there'll be prizes. There's going to be Play-Doh challenge. Any kids here like Play-Doh? Any adults here who like Play-Doh? <laughs> so at any rate, uh, we'll have a Play-Doh challenge. And then uh, after it's done, uh, the activities and things and games, we're going to give you a lunch to bring home with you. So that's why we need you to sign up. Sign up, you get lunch. You don't sign up, you have all the fun, but no lunch. <laughs> who, 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 who wants lunch, right? Everyone wants lunch. But at any rate, uh, we'll get those things up. So we'll be done a little bit after 11, I think, with all those activities. So they'll just be the morning, okay? It'll just be morning, service, family time. The evening is free for you to be with your family, <gasps> okay? Spend time with them, enjoy them and things. Uh, so that's what we're looking to do. There won't be any PM service on that Sunday. So look forward to that opportunity to be together. And, uh, and then uh, Pastor Matt has mentioned as well to me, if you are in need of any uh, envelopes for giving, uh, please see him or fill out a form online and uh, on our website there, uh, uh, Facebook, on our Facebook website, and uh, that'll help us out, help you out for giving. And I do want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving to the Lord and to his ministry here. I appreciate that very much. I'm going to take a moment now to pray. In our uh, country this week, it's been interesting, has it not? Uh, see what's happening uh, with the truck convoy and things. And I know lots of people have different opinions upon it, and that's fine. You can have a different opinion. That's what's about a free society, right? Democracy. You can disagree or agree, uh, but I'm going to tell you right now, our country needs the Lord more now than ever. And uh, well, we'll pray for, some, for peace. Uh, thankfully, nothing bad happened yesterday up there in Ottawa, and we want to see that continue, uh, civility uh, and things of that nature, and most importantly, that our nation would see their need for Christ. Uh, that's the biggest need in our day. So we're going to take a moment to pray for that right now. 
Dear Jesus, thank you uh, for your loving kindness. Thank you for our country, Canada. And Lord, uh, there's no doubt there's been much strife. There's a lot of anger. And Lord, there is wicked things that have taken place. There's no doubt. And Lord, we look to you, uh, Lord, to give wisdom. Lord, for those who are gathering in Ottawa today, and uh, Lord, allow there to be peace, civility. But Lord, most importantly, help the need uh, the, the folks there and around our country to see their need is not government leadership as such, but they need Christ. And Lord, help us to be a lighthouse uh, for you in this part of Canada, in our community. And Lord, we do pray for our leaders. It's mentioned in Scripture that we need to. And Lord, I pray that they would have wise counsel, that Christian counselors would be able to uh, attend to their ear, and Lord, give them wise biblical counsel. And Lord, I pray that they would come to Christ. Our leaders need Jesus just as much as the common everyday man. Lord, we look to you to provide and look for you to bring healing. Lord, bring salvation. Lord, I pray that you would help us to do our part in this part of our great land. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, let's stand up for our next hymn, Blessed Be the Name, Blessed Be the Name. On the first verse, all praise to him who reigns above in majesty so Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. At God the Father's own right hand, her angel host adore. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name shall be the Counselor, the mighty Prince of next him uh, does Jesus care does Jesus care all right on the first verse does Jesus care when my heart is pained to deeply for and song as a
You may be seated. so much. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel 16. It's always nice to hear that orchestra. It'd be nice to hear it again in real time, right? And we look forward to that coming again. Uh, Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 16, and there is Kids Church tonight. I forgot to mention that in my announcement. Uh, kids Church is on tonight, so uh, look forward to kids. Come on out and uh, enjoy yourself with Pastor Matt and be instructed in the Word, all right? So 1 Samuel chapter 16, uh, God has chosen David to lead Israel. That's what's going to be taking place in this portion of Scripture. David was the youngest son of Jesse. He was a nobody from nowhere town. Bethlehem wasn't a famous town or anything. Uh, yet by God's leadership, uh, David would become the greatest king that Israel ever had. And during his life, he received great promise. He had lots of blessings, remarkable blessings, actually. Uh, and we see that David was a man after God's own heart. And, you know, you could say that and say, I'm a man or a woman after God's own heart, but God's word affirms that in Acts chapter 6, or 13, verse 22. I'll read it for you. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto him David to be king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my way. So David was following the Lord. Now, David wasn't perfect, is he? I mean, he made lots of mistakes. He made big ones, uh, far from being perfect. But he kept short accounts with the Lord. You'll see that he made mistakes. Then he went to the Lord and said, Lord, forgive me. Give me grace. Give me mercy. Please, please forgive me. And uh, he sinned, but quick to confess, uh, had a genuine uh, heart of repentance and David has much uh, to teach us or be an example of how to let God lead. He leadeth me. And that should be the desire of our hearts today as Christians to let the Lord lead. So 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. 
And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee, and, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom uh, I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify, sanctify yourselves, and come with me to sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked up on Eliab, and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth, for a man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. And Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. And again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto uh, Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he cometh hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all of a, good, a beautiful countenance, goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of the oil, anointed him in the midst of the brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose and went to Ramah. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for another day. Thank you for these dear folks who are here in person, those who are watching online. And Lord, all of us, no matter our position, our stature, our age, maturity level, we all need to follow you. We need to follow your lead. And Lord, I pray you would help us this morning to see the, how you worked in David's life and how you work in ours if we'd be willing to follow. And Lord, I pray you bless this message now in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The title of my message is How God Chooses. <clears throat> this chapter opens up the first few verses there, and it remind, it's a reminder of Samuel the fact that Saul had been rejected as king. Saul was chosen by the people because the people wanted uh, a, a, to be a, have a king like the other nations. And up until that point, God had ruled the nation by setting up judges and things of that nature. And that's how it operated from Moses into the judges. But now they wanted a king. And he had warned them that elevating a man to the throne would cause problems. There would be corruption. There would be trouble. You find that in 1 Samuel chapter 8. When Saul was chosen to be king, the people were thrilled. He was a giant of a man for an Israelite, fine specimen. And while he might have been head and shoulders a giant of a man, physically, spiritually, he was a baby. He hadn't, didn't have much spiritual life in him. Saul was a jealous man, and he lived for the praises of men. And he tended to overstep his boundaries, and he was guilty of disobedience to the commands, direct commands of the Lord. And as a result, the Lord said, I'm done with him, and rejected him as king. It's because of Saul's rebellion, God has to choose another king to, to take care of Israel. And he chooses David. David is the man. And David, though, is a very unlikely candidate to be the king of Israel, the next king. But God's choice as David is king shows us the process of how God went about it. And it's an interesting study. So first of all, we see his choices are sovereign. Our God's choices are sovereign. It, it, against this backdrop of Saul's rebellion and rejection by God, God begins the pro process of choosing a new king. He's ready to raise up that king. And the Lord is working behind the scenes to prepare the way that he's planned. And the Lord is working behind the scenes in your life today, too. If you know Christ as Savior and you're following the Lord, he is working behind the scenes, working things together. And so Samuel is told that we're to find the new king. The first uh, couple of verses there tell us he goes to Bethlehem, to Jesse, and the Lord has arranged things for this choosing this next king. And if you were to look into the ancestry of King David, you'll find the Lord's hand moving and shaping that whole event as well. 
one of David's ancestors was a woman named Rahab in Judges chapter 2. She had been saved out of pagan idolatry and brought into the nation of Israel. She married a man named Salome in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. You'll find the record there of that. And became the mother of a man named Boaz. Boaz is found in Ruth chapter 4. Boaz also married a Gentile girl brought out of paganism by the sovereign grace of the Lord, and her name was Ruth. And Ruth and Boaz were the great, great grandparents or great grandparents of this boy named David. Can you see, isn't that amazing how the Lord brought all? Rahab should not have been there. Ruth should not have been in that line, but God brought it all together. He's working behind the scenes. Those events are not accidental. They're part of the perfect plan formulated in eternity past. The Lord's working on those. It's not a coincidence. It's by the Lord's hand. You know, many of us have great plans. We have great dreams, all right? But we often lack the power to bring them to pass. You know, dreaming is free. But to actually make it happen, that costs time, money, sweat, tears, you know, type of thing. So the reality is, what he proposes, the Lord, though, he's able to dispose. What the Lord says will happen, he will do. Uh, God rules in the affairs of men. In our world today, is no different. God rules. I think about Napoleon. I'm going to mention him another time a little later. Uh, Napoleon, at the height of his career, or his empire, was a very, uh, very cynical about God. I'm not saying he ever became a Christian, but he was considerably cynical about it in his, at the height when he thought he was the greatest. And someone asked him if God was on the side of France during this expansion of the French Empire. And he answered, God is on the side that has the heaviest artillery. The reason he said that is because he was an artillery officer. Then came the Battle of Waterloo, where Napoleon lost both the battle and the empire. Years later, in exile in the island of St. Helena, which is in the South Atlantic. I've, I've actually, by, totally by accident, uh, looked at pictures recently of the place. I heard about it. Man, you don't want, if that's your ending place. It's not a horrible place, but there's nothing there. It's the end of the world. You can see it from its shores, okay? And this is where he was exiled, and he's reported to have quoted the words of Thomas Kemp. It said, man proposes, God disposes. That's absolutely true. God does it. God does what he says, a lesson of history and a lesson of the Bible. So what can we learn from God's sovereign choices? First of all, there are no accidents in life. Well, you say, well, I had an accident in my car. Well, yeah, well, the Lord allowed it, okay? The idea is that the Lord allows things. Everything that occurs is part of a larger plan. God is working behind the scenes in ways that we cannot comprehend to accomplish his plan and his purposes. Psalm uh, 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. And I thank God for that truth, that he is in absolute control. I mean, going to be honest, that is hard to fathom sometimes, isn't it? We can hardly figure out our own day-to-day -day activities. I'm not, I'm not in control. Listen, you get in a room full of kids, you are not in control. All right, you've got nursery kids, you've got five or six of them there, and you're by yourself. You are panicking. You're probably getting a paper bag because <gasps> you're not in control. Those kids are running around everywhere. Listen, God is always in control. Always. He's always in control. God is able, second, to bring his plan to pass. He will never propose a plan that he's not able to accomplish whether it's a plan to raise up a shepherd boy to, make, a boy to make him king or whether it's a plan to work out his will in your life, it, well, he can do it. He's able to see it through. You know, he's able to bring it to pass. Job 42, verse 2, I know that thou canst do everything, everything, and no thought can be withholden from thee. Thirdly, God's sovereign choices extend to every area of life. It's just not for kings. It's just not for pastors. It's for everyone in all parts of our lives. I don't presume to understand it all, but I believe the Bible to be true, and the Bible teaches us and tells us and instructs us that God is in the business of working out all things according to His will. 
That's what the Bible says. For uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, in whom also you have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. This is God's will. This is his plan. He has, he has a plan. And he brings it to those purposes to pass. Isaiah 46, verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do my pleasure. Yea, I have spoken it. I will bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Have you ever seen a little person say, I'm going to do this? And you kind of laugh and chuckle to yourself like, I could pick you up, buddy, with one hand. You're not doing that. That, that. That's not a good idea, whatever it is. Hey, and we can change it. Listen, as adults will say, we're going to do this, and then something happens and it doesn't come close to what happens. When God says it's going to happen, I have purposed it, I will also do it. That's not a threat. That's the truth. I will do it. I will do as I say. And some people are really bothered by the notion, the truth, that God is in absolute control of all life. Now, do I understand all the things that God does? Not a chance. I don't understand it, but the reality is, as Christians, we should find comfort in that, that God is in control. He's working something out. and not, It might not be pleasant. It might be a horrible thing right now, but God has a plan, and he's working that plan. And we need to be willing to follow him. His choices are surprising. His choices are surprising, number two. Samuel sets off to Bethlehem to anoint the new king. He arrives and he commands uh, Jesse to gather his sons together. Uh, there's going to be, you know, they had to be sanctified. There's going to be an offering and things. He brings a heifer with them. And the old prophet uh, makes all the sons of Jesse pass by one by one. And in this process, God makes known his choice for king, but it's really a surprise. Verses 6 to 10, I already read that for you. We, we are introduced to Eliab and, and Abinadab and Shammah. I almost want to call him Shamwow, but at any rate, uh, I have a friend of mine who had a, a cat named Shamwow, and every time I read that, sometimes it comes to mind. But at any rate, that's a different thought. Uh, and he's, he brings his, his kids by, his children by, his sons by. Eliab, you know what his name means? God is Father. God is Father. That's a good name, isn't it? That's a great name. He's a, he's a good-looking man. He, he, he's built for to lead. He, he's not a little shrimp, all right? Like, this guy has the physical traits to be king, and Samuel thinks, this is the guy. This is the man. But God says, I refuse him. That word refuse simply means to reject. Reject. Eliab might have looked pleasing outwardly, but the character of the man disqualified him. Abinadab means my father is noble. Another great name. My father is noble. But he too is past. Shammah, his name means astonishment. That's a different name, meaning maybe referred to his physical size or some sort of physical trait, we don't know, but doesn't matter, because he too is rejected. That's not the guy. And then one by one, all the sons of Jesse come forward. Seven of them pass by, and the Lord says, nope, none of those. And surely all these young men uh, were in fine shape. They were, uh, you know, toned by hours and hours of fa- hard labor. Any one of them had the physical presence required to turn the heads of people and say, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, that's a good-looking guy to be our ruler as king. But none of them possess the right character. Character is important. All right? What, guess what fades? The looks, right? The muscles are not the same in 40 years. But character stays, and it can grow greater. All right? And, and these guys don't have that character. God sees what man cannot see. Even Samuel, again, was impressed with Eliab, but God wasn't. And you think to yourself, well, Samuel should have learned from this already. I mean, he, he anointed uh, Saul, and that, was, that turned out to be a disaster. Hey, we act the very same way Samuel does. 
Is what we see is what we see. We, we, I, I can't tell what's in your heart. I see the, the outward appearance. And God doesn't make choices based on what the outward characteristics are, but what he sees in the contents of the heart. God tells Samuel in verse number 7 that that's, the Lord looketh on the heart. Physical attributes don't mean anything. God looks at the heart of the man. Before Saul ever ceased uh, being king, God had already determined to raise up another man with the right kind of heart. You can find that in 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. They all looked apart. Jesse's sons all looked apart. And Samuel could not see the condition of their hearts. Uh, for example, Eliab, uh, he, he caught the old prophet's eye. He's like, man, this would be a great guy. But a few verses later reveals the heart of this man. And it was critical. It was jealous. And it was negative. Let me read you a verse in 1 Samuel 17, verse number 28. That's just one chapter over. And Lob, his eldest brother, heard when he had spake unto the men, and Lob's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the haughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down here that most seest the battle. The reason I've read it that way is I think of how sometimes kids speak to each other, adults speak to each other, who are dealing with jealousy. They're bitter, they're upset, they're negative. He didn't say this in a nice tone. He was trying to scare the little boy away, David. Get out of here, youngest. Get away from here. As God looks at your life, what does he see? Looks at your life. Don't worry about anyone sitting next to you. What does God see when he looks at your life? Does he see someone who's handsome, beautiful, a pleasing physical appearance, a well-dressed individual? No, he doesn't see those things. He sees your heart. He sees the you. And the question for us to answer is, does God see a heart that he can use? Because listen, none of us are perfect. David's a great example. He wasn't perfect, but he had a heart that sought after God. We all can have that same heart. David wasn't the only person born with that kind of heart, like only one person in the whole universe will get that. No, all of us could have that heart, to be chasing after God, to be pursuing after the Lord. We, we, uh, we're like Samuel. We judge people by what they are, what we see. Aren't you glad that God looks at us otherwise? He looks at you and says, oh, if he will follow me, he can do something great for me. Or if she will follow me, I can use her in great marvelous ways to touch lives. The Lord sees potential in lives, amen? Isn't it nice to be around people who encourage you because they say, oh, I see potential in you to serve the Lord. Or maybe it's in, the, in your uh, workplace. The person says, I see potential at this workplace. Let me invest in you. Follow me and I will help you. Uh, I'll give you everything I have to help you be the best whoever, whatever it is. That's the Lord's desire for every one of his people. Follow me and you'll get the best. Who doesn't want the best? Nobody I know. You, would you rather uh, a soddy old steak, it's been out and it's almost half cooked by the sun on the barbecue, that's not done right? Or do you want the best triple-A sirloin steak that's been marinated? You want the best! Unless you don't like steak, and then you need to talk to the Lord, okay? All right. You want the best! And the Lord desires the best for us. But we need to follow him. We need to follow him. After the seven sons of Jesse had passed by, Samuel said, no, they're not the ones. Samuel finds out there's another one. <clears throat> uh, now, verse 11 is kind of funny to me. And Samuel said unto Jesse, are, there, are here all thy children? Sometimes as dads, do we ever lose track of our kids? Sometimes. This guy totally forgot about his son. And he doesn't even call him by his name. He says, oh, the youngest is in the field. If Jesse's wife was around, he got a slap for that, all right? You know, the reality is he totally forgot. He, he's the youngest. He's so insignificant. He's, he's not even summoned with the rest of the boys. He's left out of the feast and the sacrifice. He's not there eating or anything or being involved. He's out there doing the humblest of servant work. And like I said, when he's mentioned, he's just called the, the youngest, all right? 
And when he walks in, Samuel sees a a young man, bright-eyed, and God tells him, this is the man, anoint him. The one rejected and and passed over by others is the one that's picked by the Lord, not rejected by the Lord. They said, oh, dad said, oh, don't call him in. And the brother's like, oh, it's one of us alive. I can see him now. Oh, it's me. I am the oldest. And reality is that culture, the oldest, was preferred. There's no doubt. But they didn't even think to call him. And the Lord picks him. And I, I, I got get this a bit of mental picture in my mind that, you know, Jesse and all his sons are there and they're going to like, what is going, David? What? I'm sure Jesse is proud at any rate because he's dad, but I'm just, he might be a little surprised too as well. Maybe that's some of the, the reason why I'd lie was as nasty as he was to David because he thought he should be king. And he watched that prophet over to David he went and poured the anointing oil on his head. Again, we must be careful how we assess those around us. All right? God excels in taking nobodies and making them somebodies for his honor and for his glory. When God went after a man after his own heart, he, he didn't go to palaces. He didn't go to temple or a places of influence and power. He went to a very unlikely place and found a very unlikely boy that was in a very humble place serving as best he could. You know, Napoleon, back in 1809, was tromping around Europe. He was conquering. He was invading the nation of Austria. Cities and villages and hamlets were falling to his grip, and the world wondered if it would ever stop. While that mad little emperor was roaming around causing destruction in Europe, you know, thousands of babies entered the world in 1809, if not millions. But who people don't care about babies at that moment. They were more concerned about the battles. Of course, history has a way of clarifying things. You know, uh, we see regimes and men try to hide history. It's amazing how history always comes out because it's the truth. All right? So when the truth uh, comes out, it clarifies things. While that war raged in 1809, England witnessed the birth of William Gladstone and Alfred Lord Tennyson. Germany greeted a baby named Felix Mendelssohn. America welcomed Edward Allan Poe, Olive, Oliver Wendell Holmes. And in the cabin of an extremely poor family in the hills of Kentucky, a little baby boy was born by the name of Abraham Lincoln. Now, nearly two, over 200 years later now, no one but historians, war historians, know many names of the battles that took place in 1809 with, by Napoleon, but, and no one really cares, but people know those names that I just mentioned in all kinds of different realms. I'm sure there's a huge statue of Abraham Lincoln in Washington, D.C. 1809, who's that? You don't find any huge statues of Napoleon, do you? you know, the reality is God has a way of working things out, and he'll use those who are unknown for his glory. I'm fine being unknown. I want to be used for him. And I hope that's your desire as well. And the preacher's desire, the congregation's desire, the the desire of all Christians, we can leave an impact in this world if we would follow the shepherd, follow him. His choices are precise. His choices are precise. God had a specific plan in mind. He sent Samuel to Bethlehem, specific place, right? And to a specific family, Jesse's family. And then he said, this is specifically David is the next king. It's precise. And there's some indicators in this scripture for us to help us understand why God made the choice in the life of David as well. First of all, God chooses those that are ready. God chooses those who are ready. When Jesse uh, and David's brothers were brought before Samuel, they were sanctified, verse, verse number five. And he said, peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to, to sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. Guess who was not there? David, right? He wasn't there. He was still in the field, right? Because Jesse didn't think you should call him. And the idea here of a sanctified, 
they're, these, this has been dealing with their sin. They, they were getting ready to, be, to worship the Lord. When David's brought, there's no time to be sanctified, but he's ready nonetheless. He's ready. David is a picture of the believer who keeps his heart and mind state in readiness on the Lord. I'm ready to serve. He does not know when the Lord might call him, so he stays ready all the time. That's the kind of person, that's the kind of Christian God wants to use. That's the kind of Christian God wants to use today. He's looking to lead that kind of person. Are you ready today to serve the Lord? Are you ready right now to serve the Lord? A readiness. He, God chooses those who are ready. Absolutely. David, uh, God chooses those who are reliable. When God called David, we find him, he's faithfully doing what he's told to do. His dad had told him to take care of the sheep. He's taking care of the sheep. I have not, I mentioned before, I've not had ever to deal, deal with sheep, never been a shepherd, but I hear it's lonely work, it can be dirty work, but he does it. He does what's assigned to him. And after he's anointed, he goes back to the flock. He doesn't hang around, sporting around in, uh, around his brothers. He doesn't go up to Eliab and rub it in his face. Oh, I'm the king. You're going to follow me, Eliab. Benadab, get ready. No, he goes back to the flock. He serves the flock. Why? Because that's what he does. He's, that's his responsibility. He's reliable. After uh, he's called to Jerusalem to play uh, for the king because the king is troubled in his mind because he's not served the Lord anymore. The Lord's left him, and he, he comes and plays the harp for him. Verse 23, and it came to pass, and the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp and played with his hand, so Saul was refreshed. Now he plays the harp. So then where does he go? Back to the flock. Why? Because that's what he does. That's what he's supposed to do. He's given an assignment, and he's carrying it out faithfully. He goes back to the, the sheep. And we know from other scriptures that he was willing to lay down his life for that flock. You know, he, he killed a lion and a bear. And when Jesse looked at David, he just saw the young of his, of his sons. His brothers probably thought he was a, a little breath. You know, that's often how it works. And Samuel saw a young man. That's all he saw was a young man. But when God looked at David, he saw integrity, he saw responsibility, character, and faithfulness. He said, ah, that's someone I can use. God says, that's a person I can use as king. Christian, if you want to be used by the Lord, let me encourage you to be faithful where you are. We always have these pictures of grandeur in the future. And I don't have any problem with a, a dream or a desire for the future but right now, you need to be faithful. You know, you want to be a salesman at a car dealership or wherever, the desire, that, that desire of that goal, whatever it is. Well, you need to be faithful now to do whatever you need to do to reach, attain that position. That's not to say you're going to get it, but be faithful now in what God's given you. Be faithful with it. Be ready. Be reliable. Allow God to develop character, integrity, uh, be faithful. I'll help him to teach you faithfulness. You never know when God will call. Say, hey, this is the time. You need to go. You know, have you ever missed a really important phone call? The person didn't know where you were? Maybe it's for a job or a job you really want. Maybe it's something to do with school. And you're like, oh, I missed that call. It was so important. They didn't know where I was. God always knows where you are. Follow him. God always knows where you are. And he knows how and when to open up the right doors in your life. Now, don't go beating down doors that you think you deserve to be open. No, you just be faithful where God has put you and see where God will lead. Just be faithful. Be reliable today. All right? Be faithful today. Be reliable today. Uh, be faithful and walk with him. And over time... You keep that faithfulness, and it will not be surprising that God will move you to something else. I remember speaking to a pastor friend of mine, and we had mutual friends, and uh, that friend, that mutual friend, was actually a deacon in his church at one time. And he told me, he goes, I knew the Lord was going to call them to ministry. Actually, I mentioned him last week, Phil Smith. Remember Phil? The guy had cancer and things. I mentioned him last week. He was a deacon 
with uh, Pastor Wall in Fostoria, Michigan. And he said, I was not surprised when the Lord called Phil Smith into ministry because he was faithful in doing what God wanted him to do in Fostoria. I thought, that's interesting. That's a good point. God calls those who are faithful, who are reliable. I'm not saying that all of you are going to be called into ministry. No, but it could be God can move you to greater things, to serve him in greater ways. But we need to be faithful. We need to be reliable. And God chooses those who are redeemed. Uh, no doubt God, David had seen the glory of God written in the heavens, manifested in the universe. Uh, uh, Psalm 19, we just had that read just a little while ago that was written by David, just a testimony. David had witnessed God's tender care for his people in his relationship with the flock. He, he saw the parallels, maybe uh, lying on the, on the ground, watching that flock at night. He saw the, the greatness of the universe, said, this is my God, I serve him. Now, David is a very emotional man. If you've read anything of the Psalms and read anything about his life, he sees emotional, and he has no problem telling, I love God, the God of Israel. Listen, it took a whole lot of courage for him in the next chapter to tell the nation of Israel, the army, that, hey, there's a cause to fight Goliath. He's the shortest dude in the army, and that's the tallest dude over there. It took a lot of courage, but he believed, he trusted in his God. Psalm 23, you looked at last week, reveals the heart of David when he was still a young shepherd. He might have walked onto the public stage in 1 Samuel 16, and he really didn't go, a bright light was shining on him, but this is where it started. But David had been walking with the Lord for quite some time. He was saved because he had faith in God. He trusted the Lord. Listen to David's own testimony in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Five minutes later, he was dead. The Lord got the victory. And here's the point. God calls those who know him. God calls the redeemed to follow him in the sense of service and do what's right. He leads his own. He leads his own. He chooses vessels from his own to be used in great ways. Those who know him in a faith relationship, who are willing to be led. Those who are ready and reliable are candidates to be used by the Lord. And our world is so messed up. I mean, it's been messed up for ages, but we just see how it's rapidly descending into what we would know as end times. We see it all around us, and we, you know, Lord, anytime we're ready to go, the rapture can take place, Lord, help us. You know, this is the time to be reliable. This is the time to be led by the Lord so we can reach those around us. We all believe it's close, and I agree with you as well, so let's reach those around us. Let's tell them of Christ. Are, are you ready? Are you reliable to be used? Does that describe you this morning, believer? Does he lead you? Does he lead you? You know the Lord is Lord, but the, it, every day today, is he leading you? Are you letting him lead? Are you willing to follow him? Because you don't know our nature is, I'll do it my way. I know best. I know shortcuts. You know, we, we, oh, I got this figured out. I'll do it my way hey, we need to follow the shepherd. We do it our way, we'll end up in ditches. We'll end up in holes. We'll end up in places that are very uncomfortable. They're scary. They're not where God wants us, not where the shepherd wants us to be. Are you willing to follow? Is he leading you? With every head bowed and every eye closed. God is still looking for people he'll call and use for his glory. And I'm not talking about full-time ministry, though that is still happening, but just day-to-day, -day, just being Christians as we should be. Can you honestly say that in your own life, that you're ready and you're available? Do you possess the kind of character God is looking for? Now, obviously, nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes, but God's looking for us to be willing to follow him.
If you know there's problems in your walk with the Lord, I would invite you as the piano begins to play to get it right so you are in a position to follow. I invite you to confess your sins. We see in David's life, he was so quick to get it right with the Lord when he was confronted, when he realized he had erred. This is a time to, to do the same thing. Confess it to him and he will forgive. He will not turn anyone away. Maybe you don't know Christ the Savior. He won't turn you away. He desires all will come to him. He desires for you to be part of the flock of God. Christian, let's make sure that we're following the shepherd. Dear Jesus, help us, uh, Lord, to learn from your word, to learn from the example of David, a man after your own heart, but a man who dealt with sin, just like every one of us here, everyone watching. Lord, help us to be ready and available, reliable for you. Help us to follow where you lead. Pray you bless us now in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Be here at 5. Have a great afternoon. Keep looking to Jesus.